Mule deer are a hot topic here in Utah, and so tonight we uh, look to dive into some of the problems that mule deer are facing here in Utah. Yeah, I'm Adam Eagle, and thanks for tuning in. Yeah, researchers and biologists here in the state of Utah, and like you probably know if you're out on this year's deer hunt, the numbers seem down a bit. They agree, they are down. And then, you know, if you look at Utah, we're one of the more progressive states when it comes to researching our mule deer, finding out what the habitat they need or want. And so tonight, we're gonna look deep into that. And part of that is hooking up with the guys with the Division of Wildlife Resources and Brigham Young University. <laughs> Today we got a helicopter out here on the Stansbury Mountains. We're trying to catch some deer. We've been doing a long-term monitoring schedule. We actually started it way back in 2009, actually, as we were monitoring survival. In 2014, we switched over to GPS collars and started monitoring survival, uh, cause of death, condition of the animals so we can really understand how this population is doing, what are the limiting factors for the population, and how we can manage it better to improve it. The Stansbury unit is one of seven units in this study. The Stansbury deer population, like most other deer units in the state, has been declining because of the drought that we're in. Drought is a horrible thing for mule deer. It, it's real clear that when you're in these dry times, it hurts your farm production and it hurts your population growth. And we've been in two big ones, with 2018 67. and 2020. Just horrible drought situations and so we need some help from, from nature and if we can get some rain it does wonders for mule deer. Since 2009 Utah has captured and collared over 4,000 animals statewide, more than any other state in the West, all in an effort to help sustain and increase our deer population. Utah is a really diverse state as we all know and so each population faces different challenges and so by monitoring across the state we can see what's going on with these populations and target management to be most effective and, and help out the deer herds. So 36. Each deer captured is given a thorough exam. Blood is taken, a GPS collar is attached, and each deer is looked at using ultrasound to determine the amount of fat that they are currently carrying. Rump on this one is 11. Body condition is 3.5. Uh, definitely they're in better condition than they were last year. We haven't analyzed the data yet, but it appears that they're at least in average or slightly better than average condition relative to the past seven years. It's great news. So part of that could be, Adam, that because of the drought, a lot of the deer may have lost their fawns early. And if they lose their fawns early in the summer, they always come in to the winter fatter than if they're nursing their fawns late into the fall. Yeah. One thing that I think that has been really interesting is that summer drought appears to be much more important than winter severity. <laughs> so the monsoons were lifesavers for most of these deer. They're coming in at normal or a better than normal condition in, in many regions of the state. That means that overwinter survival should be great and it has it has much, many more cascading impacts than that. For example, we know that the condition of the mother is translated into the fawn's birth size, and the fawn's birth size is translated into its growth rate. Its growth rate dictates whether it survives that first winter or not, and not only that, it dictates how big the antlers are five years later. One of the key results from the data is that we probably need to focus more on summer range than what we've been doing in the past, which is winter range. And what would that mean? Fires? That'd mean fires, high elevation fires. And it's hard to get through the process. Most of the high elevation summer range is forest service, and it's hard to get approval to burn forest service lands. She's got a little bit of fat. She's gonna have she's gonna have five. None of this would be possible yes. without the partner. So there there's a great partnership with BYU. We started this uh, really this type of monitoring in 2012. Been working with them for almost 10 years uh, on the deer survival study, which is everything that we're doing here today. But the truth is that's not the only partnership we have. Um, there's a great partnership with the public as well. A lot of people donate time, come out here to help with captures. And then there's the funding that goes into all this. We could not do this without the conservation groups. Color frequency, 148. We talk about SFW, MDF, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, and, and there's some that I'm not listing, obviously. Utah Archery Association, we couldn't do it without the funding they provide. So with all of this data, with everything these researchers are learning, how can it help our deer herds? That's a tough question, because as these researchers are finding out, not every deer herd on a particular unit is being affected by the same problem. One might be declining because of habitat, another might be declining because of predators, 
they're all different. Once you get that information though, it's the DWR's job to figure out what to do. I mean, that's what the public wants, right? They want, yeah. they want answers, yeah. they want solutions to these questions. So this, this allows us, you know, we are a management agency. So every bit of data that we collect goes into some kind of recommendation, right? Because we know survival is this level, we can hunt at this level. This is how many deer we have on the landscape. This is what we can do to make it better. We can address predators in this area. We can address habitat in this area. So every single bit of information we collect then goes back into some sort of management decision. It's just, and, and because we have so much data, we're able to make a better decision. The GPS collars we use take a location every two hours. So we know where that deer is year round, what habitat it's using. And if that collar doesn't move for six hours, depending on the collar, six hours or eight hours, we get an email that says I'm dead and it gives me the GPS location. And we immediately deploy a crew to go to find that animal and determine the cause of death. And so when we look at it all, we can see what percent of mortality is caused by predation, what percent is malnutrition. And so what we do is try and target management towards that limiting factor and, and we see that it's just different on every unit. So for example in the South Manti we found deer coming in in good shape. So they're not dying of malnutrition but cougar predation was a big factor and, and it was causing 20 plus percent of the mortality on that unit on the adults. So we have increased cougar predation there and we've seen a rebound where predation is now lower and the survival of the adults is up to 90 plus percent this past year. Contrast that with Pine Valley, for example, where we also increased cougar take and saw an increase in harvest. Cougar predation was never a major factor driving that population, and so even with the increased cougar take, it hasn't really increased that population yet. They seem to be more limited by the drought and some malnutrition things, so we need to work more on habitat in that unit. Uh, and just focus our efforts wherever the, the data are suggesting that we're actually having these problems. In an effort to learn more about the predator-prey relationship, researchers have recently started collaring mountain lions along the Wasatch Front. We already have 11 mountain lions on the air, and so we can look at movement patterns at that urban wildlands interface along the Wasatch Front. But we're also looking at food habits of those animals. So. One of the questions that's come from the Utah State study is how many of the animals, uh, the mule deer that are being eaten, are actually being killed by lions and how many are being scavenged by lions. If we get three locations of a lion in the same spot, we immediately go in and we find out why that lion's there and almost always it's because it's killed something and it's eating it there. So one thing we've already learned is that a few of these lions during the summer were eating a fawn mule deer every other day. So three or four fawn mule deer a week. Our populations are down, which is frustrating for a lot of people, and, and our permit numbers are down and, and the buck ratios are down. So we have a lot of things working against us. But the good news is we're starting to see, because of the monsoons and where we're at right now, that they tend to be fatter right now. And the fawns that, that have made it to this point, they tend to be heavier right now, which is great news. So we're hoping that, barring some real extreme winter events, that we should have good survival across the state for both adults and fawns. And then because of the does being in good shape right now, hopefully our production next June will be in great, and then that'll lead to good fawn doe ratios next year. So I think we're set up to grow populations. You know, we're gonna need some help from nature, obviously, but I think we're in really good shape, and, and hopefully we're, we'll start turning the trend on the valley and, and start to grow these populations. And mule deer are a priority. That's the reality. Uh, and, and we know it, and we know it that our public thinks it's a priority, or we know that it's a priority for them. And so we're gonna keep doing everything we can to start to keep managing for mule deer. We've been doing it for, I think this is our seventh year, and we're starting to really incorporate this data into making management decisions. And so it, it's really valuable to us, and we're just gonna keep doing it as long as it's useful for us. Such a win-win for you and your students, too. It's a win-win for us, for the state, for the sportsmen of the state, for our students, absolutely. Yeah, it's fun to see, and it's fun to see you guys as passionate you are as you are about the work as you are the wildlife and just you guys throw a lot of a lot into this. You're thinking about it all the time, aren't you? All the time. We text each other. Hey, I had this idea. What do you think? Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's yeah. just there's as you get more and more data, the more the more questions pop up. And yeah. so there's a lot we I've learned, a lot we have yet to learn, and so we're putting it all together and, and doing the best we can to manage meal there as well as we can in the state. Hey, I'm Adam Eco KSL Outdoors. Remind you to get with your family, your friends, make some memories by getting out and experiencing some of Utah's wildlife. We'll see you next weekend. Good night.